Well, here we are with video two of lesson A on pressure in our fluid mechanics unit. In this video, we're going to further explore hydrostatic pressure and begin to be able to put some mathematics to this situation. Here we go. So a fluid that is in hydrostatic equilibrium is not flowing. It's steady in one space. Now, the molecules of a liquid interact by weak molecular bonds, and those bonds tend to keep the molecules close together. So if we were to take a look at just a cylinder of liquid in, a, in hydrostatic equilibrium, this volume of fluid tends to stay in that spot. Now, this volume of fluid also has a weight. Now, it's that weight that is responsible for the pressure in a liquid. So pressure increases with depth in a liquid because the, the liquid below is being squeezed by all the liquid above including any other liquid that's above it or any air that's above it pressing down on it from above. So whatever's above the liquid pushes down on the top of the cylinder. The cylinder of liquid then is in a static equilibrium. The liquid on each side of the cylinder pushes with equal amount of force. Okay, so these two forces here pushing in, the pressure pushes at all points, but these two forces here, because they're at equal depth, are going to be pressing with the same amount of force. The liquid beneath pushes up on the cylinder, and the pressure down here is greater than the pressure up here. So for any volume of fluid that has a downward force due to the pressure from the fluid above, and has a downward force due to the weight of the fluid contained in that volume, there's also an upward force due to the pressure from the fluid below. Because the pressure from below is greater than the pressure from above, our net force is zero. And we know from the pressure equation that we introduced in the first video that the, the downward force then is equal to the pressure at that point times the area at that point. And the, the force from the pressure below is equal to the pressure at that point times the area at that point. And the weight of the fluid is simply mg. Now, because these horizontal forces cancel out, we can say then that the force at the base of that volume of fluid is equal to the force pushing down on that volume of fluid plus mg. Now remember, this liquid is a cylinder of a cross-sectional area A and a height D. Its volume is V equals AD, and its mass, remember from our density equation, is density times volume, so density times area, times d. If we substitute this then into the expression for the mass of the liquid up here, we find that the area cancels from all the terms and we results in the hydrostatic pressure equation. Now this question, pressure equation will give us the pressure at a certain depth where this P naught right here is going to be the pressure of that fluid above it. If the surface is open to the air then, P naught is equal to the pressure from the atmosphere, usually one atmosphere, or if at sea level, 1.013 times 10 to the 5 pascals. If the surface is covered by some sort of a gas, then it's going to be the pressure of that gas. If the surface is covered uh, completely by a, a container, then the pressure above it is zero. And oftentimes, you'll be told in a problem to, that you can ignore the atmospheric pressure at whatever depth we're looking at. Now there are three important conclusions that we can draw from the hydrostatic pressure equation. First, the pressure is proportional to the depth and density of the fluid. The shape of a container or the shape of an object in that fluid has no effect on the pressure. We're able to see this because the area canceled out in the derivation of the equation. Each, each of these three containers have different shapes and volumes, but those differences in volumes will not affect the pressure of the water or any other fluid when the containers are filled. Second, a connected liquid in hydrostatic equilibrium will rise to the same height in all open regions of that container. So this figure here shows two connected tubes. The larger volume of liquid in the wide tube weighs more than the liquid in the narrow tube. So will this weight be able to push the liquid in the narrow tube up higher? 
That is, is this situation here even possible? Well, if depth d1 were larger than depth d2, then according to the hydrostatic pressure equation, the pressure at the bottom of the narrow tube would be higher than the pressure at the bottom of the wide tube. Any time there's a pressure difference, fluid will flow. So this pressure difference would cause the liquid in to flow from right to left until all the heights were equal. Therefore, a connected liquid in hydrostatic equilibrium rises to the same height in all open regions of the container. And third, the pressure is the same at all points on a horizontal line through a connected liquid in hydrostatic equilibrium. So in this picture here, the conical tube holds more liquid above the dotted line and therefore has a greater weight. So is pressure 1 at this point greater than pressure 2 at this point? Well, to answer that, we have to think about the pressure at the bottom of the tubes. If pressure 1 were larger than pressure 2, the pressure at the bottom of the left tube then would be larger than the pressure at the bottom of the right tube. This would cause the liquid to flow until the pressures were equal. Therefore, the pressure is the same at all points on a horizontal line through a connected liquid in hydrostatic equilibrium. Then to summarize all this then, if we had this container here and we filled it with water and each of these spots, one, two, and three, are open to the air, okay, water will rise to the same height in all three sections, have the same pressure at all equal horizontal points, and that pressure would be exerted on the sides of the containers would be the same. Now these three points are really the kind of the standard conditions for hydrostatic equilibrium, but there is also one more important conclusion that we can draw from this. If we were to change the pressure at the surface to P1, some other pressure at depth D, then our hydrostatic pressure equation, we have to include that initial pressure. The change in pressure then is the same at all points in the fluid, independent of the size or shape of the container. To get a good understanding of this, think about the way forces act on solid objects. The way a force acts on a solid is different than the way it acts on a fluid. Since a solid's rigid, the force doesn't change its shape. It mostly tries to move the object. A liquid can't sustain a force in that way. If you push on water, say in, in a, you fill up a bucket full of water and you try to push on the water, you make a splash. You make the water flow. If the fluid is restrained so that it can't flow and a force is acted on it, the force will increase the internal pressure of that fluid. The pressure exerted on a fluid in a closed vessel is transmitted throughout the fluid and pushes at right angles to all surfaces that it touches. This is called Pascal's principle, which says if the pressure at one point in an incompressible fluid is changed, the pressure at every other point in the fluid changes by the same amount. A really great practical example of Pascal's principle is hydraulic lifts. You see, the result of Pascal's principle can lead to a big increase of force. In this diagram here, a small force applied to the small area on the left will result in an increase of force in the area on the right. And that's because the change in pressure here has got to equal the change in pressure here. And this is a much greater area, so you're going to get a much bigger force. So pressure is exerted on a fluid, usually a small cylinder, on one side of a hydraulic lift, can, uh, so a relatively small force can lift a huge object like a car, truck, or whatever. Another really excellent example of the practical use of all this pressure stuff is a barometer. So a barometer is used to measure air pressure. The, to begin though, I want you to actually go do this little demonstration, okay? You go get yourself a bowl, fill it up with water, and then take a cup that can be submerged in that bowl, Get that cup completely filled with water, invert the cup, and then lift it up so that you have water, a little water column inside that cup. The question is, why does this water stay in this cup? Why doesn't it flow out? So actually go pause the video and go do that. I'll wait here while you go, go do that demonstration. Now, the answer to this little dilemma has to do with pressure, which makes sense. That's what we're talking about. But the answer kind of comes in two parts. First, the weight of the atmosphere pushes down on the surface of the water. 
the water in the tub is confined or the bowl is confined so the pressure exerted on the surface is transmitted throughout that liquid. The pressure exerts a force perpendicular to the surfaces of the tub and in the glass. So the water in the glass then is pushed upward, which is shown in this picture here. Second, the water in the glass wants to run out because of its weight. So it exerts a force throughout the water that acts perpendicular to the various surfaces. It acts on the water surface, so pushing it up, which can be seen from this drawing here. The result is that the two sets of forces cancel out. The water wants to run out of the glass and raise the surface of the tub, but the weight of the air pushes down, and that force is greater, so the water is pushed up into the glass. We end up with a static column of water in the glass. And this is essentially how a barometer works. In order to make ourselves a barometer, you can take a glass tube that's closed at one end and then fill the thing up with water. Now, barometers that you go and purchase are usually filled with mercury. We can't get mercury, but we can in class, and we will, make a barometer using water. Now what you got to do is you got to plug up the open end and turn the thing upside down into that water. The open end then that's now on the bottom is placed into a reservoir and the plug is removed. The mercury or water will run out of the tube until the weight of that water is equal to the weight of the air column, which leaves us essentially with a vacuum in this space here. Now, as the atmospheric pressure changes, the level of water in the tube will increase or decrease. And we can use that information to tell us things about weather, if it's an actual barometer. You know how when we hear about high pressure systems or low pressure systems, and when you have a high pressure system moving in, the weather's gonna be sunny and warmer. And we have a low pressure system moving in, that's it's gonna get colder and wetter. Well, barometers respond to those changes in the atmospheric pressure, and that's how we use them to predict the weather. Well, that'll about do it for the uh, conceptual side of pressure. From here, we're going to look at buoyancy and the buoyant force. We'll see you in class.